Welcome to the Angels Win Podcast with former Angels broadcaster Victor Rojas, featuring Jeff Stoddart and Chuck Richter. And now it's time to talk about some baseball. Victor, take it away. Uh, that's right. It's time for the Angels Win Podcast. So what are we up to, guys? Yeah, this is episode eight. I miss one week and I forget the countdown. I mean, we've done less than 10. I know that. It's We're episode eight. eight. Episode yes. eight. Uh, I'm Victor Rojas, along with Jeff Stoddart and uh, Chuck Richter, and uh, we are the Angels Win Podcast. So glad you could join us. I apologize for missing last week. I was busy in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Oh, cheers, gentlemen. I forgot. See? I was, I was doing a lot of this in We're Oklahoma last week. <laughs> I was out of practice. <laughs> Uh, I let my liver kind of catch up this week, and so here we are back once again. Cheers. <laughs> cheers, um, cheers. Let's see. Um, uh, the standard happens on our show, right? We kind of look back in time uh, to the previous week. We look ahead in time, and in between, we sandwich in a bunch of crap. Uh, sometimes they're angels-related. Sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes we vent. Uh, and just so we know, just a little disclaimer here, and we should probably have this on a scroll on the YouTube channel. <laughs> Uh, the f bombs are courtesy of Chuck Richter, he mm-hmm. is the editor and owner of AngelsWin.com, <laughs> uh, and I just wanted you to know that. Sometimes I will say some bad words, but usually it's you know when I'm I'm emotional. Chuck seems to be somewhat emotional quite often, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Okay, but uh, gentlemen, I just want to say hello. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, I'm sorry I missed last week, but I had a blast in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yeah, welcome back. How? It, it... It was great listening to you as always. Um, looked like you had some great games down there. Yeah, no, I had a fun. Uh, I, I thought we had the best regional in the country from one through four. Uh, Oklahoma State got bounced after two games, mm-hmm. which was surprising as all heck. Oral Roberts, yeah. number four seed, ended up winning it all. Um, as a matter of fact, at the time of this recording, Oral Roberts is currently leading Oregon in the third and final game of the super regional. So they got a chance to go all the way to the uh, college world series. So uh, it it was just, it was amazing. Washington was fun to watch Uh, and Dallas Baptist university. That was an amazing team as well. Had a fantastic season. Uh, But Oral Roberts just uh, the class of the, uh, of that pack right there. And it was fun to work with Keith Moreland, the legend. I kind of grew up watching him uh, when he played baseball at Texas and obviously with the Cubs and the Phillies and so on and so forth. And, it was, it was cool to get kind of back into the swing of things. Let me tell you something about ballparks at the college level. They've changed uh, dramatically since I was in college. And I'm sure dramatically <laughs> since you guys were in college, although I'm slightly older. Uh, but last year, so we drove down just to kind of digress here. And this is kind of what we do on the show. So mm-hmm. <laughs> hang with them if you don't like it. Uh, but last, last Thanksgiving, we were driving – uh, from Texas down to Florida to visit our parents. And so on the way down, I said, because Tyler, he wanted to see some of the D1 schools. And so we just kind of did this trek where we went to uh, Old Miss and Mississippi State. Uh, we stopped in Gainesville. We stopped the University of South Florida uh, and all these ballparks. And it's like, holy cow, these ballparks are unbelievable. Mississippi State's, I mean, you probably add another 1,000 seats or 2,000 seats, and that's like a triple-A stadium. That's how how mm-hmm. gorgeous it looks. And then Stillwater, uh, O'Brate Stadium there in Stillwater, that is legit. Another beautiful ballpark that's only been open for a couple of years. So I was fortunate. I had a great regional, great ballpark, great crew, and, um, you know, it was, it was fun to do it. Sorry I missed you guys. I was traveling all day on Monday. It's not the easiest place in the world to get to, Stillwater, <laughs> Oklahoma, when I'm traveling back to Florida, but – Nonetheless, had a great time, and I missed you guys. Uh, we missed you too. It was uh, it was interesting doing the podcast without you. Um, I it was fun, uh, you know, kind of being the uh, being in the lead seat. But uh, I was probably three to five minutes in before I'm like, yeah, this is uh, this is Victor's gig. This is clearly not what I was. I was made for. I'm a, I'm a color analyst at best. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, actually, I thought Chuck would have taken the lead. <laughs> actually, no, I kind of felt like, well, dad's gone. Let's uh, misbehave. <laughs> right. So the, so the F-bomb count was way up last week. I heard. Yeah. I heard. I saw it on Twitter. <laughs> As yep. he takes another drink. That's awesome. Right. Right. To warm himself up for the rest of this show. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let, let's get to uh, some... Some Angels talk, because it's, it's been kind of a nice little run for the Angels. Uh, you know, yeah. they had the five-game winning streak. that got snapped on uh, on Saturday against the Seattle Mariners. The, the Angels ended up picking up the uh, the series win on Sunday 
taking two of three from the M's after sweeping the Chicago Cubs. And I, you know, you look back on that Cubs series, and I don't know if there's anything specific. Uh, just on the week, as you talk about collectively as a team versus the Cubs and the Mariners, we could talk about, and we will, I'm sure, you know, Mike Trout struggles, Shohei mm-hmm. on the mound, Jared Walsh continues to struggle, Taylor Ward, maybe, maybe not coming out of it, Patrick Sandel. There's a lot of individual things, a lot of individual pieces you could talk about, right? But at the end of the day, when you take away a, a five and one week, you, you're pretty happy, right? You, you mm-hmm. sweep the Cubs, which you should be sweeping the Cubs. They're not a very good team. Seattle yeah. Mariners have played better of late they got off to a not so good start considering what they did last year but you take two of three against the uh, against the mariners which is fantastic as you go out on the road and we'll talk about next week later on but it's a big four game series against the texas rangers that kicks Mm -hmm. off uh, on monday night but your assessment on the series between the cubs and the series against the seattle mariners guys uh, I'll jump in. I, you know, one of my best friends is a huge Cubs fan. So I enjoyed this series sweep more than I would most. Um, it, it was, it was good though. I mean, you know, other than the things that you, you kind of touched on, um, you know, the first game Otani and trout both Homer in the same game, which was, which was nice. And then that kind of led into, uh, a slump where, um, where Trout was hitless and I think, you know, 13, 14 at bat, which he, he then snapped on Sunday uh, against the M's, which, you know, good that he was getting out of that. But, you know, Anderson got the win, um, went five innings in the first game. Berea pitched well. Uh, you know, Detmers got his first, his first W of the season, which was, you know, nice to get that monkey off of his back. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Uh, he, yeah. You know, his record doesn't reflect how he is pitched, uh, but uh, you know, overall, I good, good series. Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, you have to beat the Cubs. We talked about this before. Mm-hmm. You got to beat the the teams that you should beat, and they did. We talk about it, but you still got to get it done, and they did. And you took two or three from the Mariners who were right behind you in the standings and they got a great pitching staff. They got a great bullpen. Um, you know, they got bats, but their man, their, their strikeout rate for the, some of their bigger bats is concerning. If you're a Mariners fan, um, I, I think that, you know, the angels typically and, and Victor, Jeff, you know, this, uh, whenever they, they face a new guy like woo, on Saturday, mm-hmm. <laughs> they were wooed. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and so, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think that, uh, but overall, I mean, we beat one of their better young pitchers today. I mean, crushed him. And mm-hmm. so I, I think that overall, I mean, I'm stoked after this week. I really am. If if you would, if we would, getting back to our last podcast, when it was just Jeff and I, um, taking two or three from the Mariners and sweeping the Cubs, just drawing that up. We couldn't be more happy uh, mm-hmm. with those projections. So, I, how, I think, how, how are you feeling about the club in general? Based on, so you know, we're middle um, of June now, roughly, and and where the club is taking care of business, five and one. That's great. I think that's fantastic. Six and a half games out of first place uh, in the American League West, a game and a half back of the second wild card spot, uh, five games over five hundred. So you're you're kind of. Do you still feel good about this team? I mean, there you've got to win the games that you're supposed to win, and that's this week was clearly one of those situations. You would have taken four and two, you're ecstatic at five one and six and oh, but you went five and one. Okay, great. That's you want some momentum rolling into next week. But as a as a team right now, are are you are you sold that this is a team that's going to the postseason and, and deep into the postseason? Because I think that's August 1st is the trade deadline. That, these are the conversations we were having in April and May or whatever. And it's like, okay, now we're mid June. Right. And now you're trying to figure out, okay, what team do we have? Mm-hmm. What do we, we're seeing what we have some from a depth perception um, at the minor league level. Cause we've had a lot of guys come up to the big leagues from trip from triple A and double A. Uh, where do you see this ball club right now? And, and I mean that from an honest, honest opinion, because I think I'm still just kind of like, eh, Okay, yeah, maybe they get to the postseason. Do I, do I think it's a team that can go deep in the postseason? No, mm-hmm. I, I really don't. I just don't see it. I haven't, or at least they haven't shown it yet. Right. And when you're showing glimpses, and people say, "Oh, but the, that's on paper," or the team is showing glimpses of this. 
it's not glimpses. You've got to have a team that's, you know, rock solid that can that that can run off a number of, you know, wins consecutively uh, and be able to go deep into a postseason. So I, I asked that question. I kind of answered it myself, <laughs> at least my sense. But I want I want your guys' input, obviously, just so so it's not a one sided conversation. Sure. That, that's how I feel. And, I, and I'm just being I mean, 30,000 foot view as a guy that likes and loves baseball and lived it. Mm-hmm. That's my true gut feeling about this club right now. I think that's a fair and honest assessment. For me, the word is consistency. Right. It, to, you know, you use the word glimpses. And I think that if, if glimpses can turn into consistency, then, yeah, this might be a team that could, that could do something. But could is not, you know, something that you, you know, you build a foundation on. Yeah. Um, I would like to think that the talent's there. If they can turn some of the glimpses that we have seen from a lot of the young kids uh, that, that have been coming up into consistency, if Rendon can stay healthy for the balance of the season, you know, Mike Trout's in a slump right now. He's, I, I don't think any of us really think this is what we're going to see for him, you know, batting 250 ish for the balance of the year. Um, if Otani can straighten things out on the mound, maybe, yeah. But as we sit here today, no, I, I, I think it, it's still, there's still more hope than there is certainty. At least so for me. Both you and uh, Victor mentioned glimpses, and we go back to a previous podcast where we talk about this all the time, about this club firing on all cylinders, right? Mm-hmm. And the glimpses are what? The glimpses are what we think are what this team has talent-wise and depth-wise, which we, the Angels did not have in previous years, in a long time, actually. Um, and I think... That to your point, Jeff, consistency needs to, they need to go into Texas and, you know, you can come out of it and, you know, you think about, you know, splitting the series. Um, okay. Meh. But mm-hmm. they need to win three or four in my opinion. No doubt. And, no and, doubt. and it make a statement and crush them. And I mean, right. crush them. And I, I think they can, I mean, we can go over, you mentioned Otani's struggles on the mound. Um, Sandoval has been, don't get me started on him. I'm trying not to use a curse word this week. Um, <laughs> we need and, a swear jar. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there are positives. I mean, Canning has pitched really well. Mm-hmm. You know, Perea has pitched well. Detmer's finally put it all together. And I, I think that... You know, and don't get me started on Zach Neto. Honestly, I think we could do a whole podcast segment on Zach Neto for 30 minutes, and I would just be gushing how great this <laughs> player is. I, I I just can't. We're talking defensively on the base paths. I'm at the plate. But I, I really think that the Angels have a good blend of youth that is from their own system, which is great. I mean, it's been a while, Victor. I mean, Remember yeah. going back to the '90s when you know we had the Salmons and you know Andersons and Erstads, Gloss, I, Easley, all those guys, and it's it's nice to see some of their own play, their own players from their own organization come up and contribute. Soriano's been amazing. I, I the bullpen has been outstanding, mm-hmm. and so consistency. I think they got the right players. May we can. I don't know if we want to uh, shift later and talk about Walsh, but there needs to be something done about Walsh. But overall, I think that they just need to make a statement in Texas, and then mm-hmm. we'll cover it next. You know, on the next podcast. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you, and especially as it relates to the Rangers series, I think I think a split against the Rangers and the Rangers think that's a win. Yep, it's a push yep. for them. They don't care. They're sitting atop the division, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, and I don't, I don't know if you guys sense this, but it seems like from a from a Rangers fan base perspective, again, my assessment, having lived in that area, having worked for that franchise as well, 
they have a thing for the angels. They, mm. I, they get geeked up for the mm. angels and beating the angels. Uh, and maybe it was because of that run that, you know, Sosha and the angels had for such a long period of time. And, uh, and then, and then, you know, trout came along and then they, they go out and sign whether it worked out or not, it didn't matter, but they go out and sign Josh Hamilton and CJ Wilson and then Albert Poole. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. ah, the, you know, the, the dreaded angels right here, they're going out again. So I, I don't think anybody's loving, uh, the situation that the angels have been in for the last 12, 13 years, more than Ranger fans, right? One playoff appearance. Uh, it's one more than what they've had, but that being said, uh, it, it's, it's just satisfying for them. So I, that's why I say two and two, four game series for the Rangers that they, they'd like to win all four. Don't get me wrong, but for them, it's a push. Um, and it kind of sends a message that you, you're not yet on our level right now. Now, that being said, the Rangers have played exceptional baseball. They really yeah. have. And even with DeGrom going down and having to have the Tommy John surgery, uh, they've had other guys step up. And I think that was a, one of the biggest questions that I had about that ball club this year was, what's that staff going to look like, really? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many, how many innings are you really going to get out of that staff? And then they obviously had questions in the bullpen. I did not think that that offense was going to be – as stupid as it is, uh, as far as putting up numbers, uh, but I knew they were going to score some runs. So it's a pretty good team, and th they've played pretty good baseball both at home and on the road. And so I, my hope is that the Angels do take this five and one past week, and do use the momentum going into Arlington, and try to take care of business. I think if you don't win three of four, you know the season's not over, but it's 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 just hard. It just it just makes it that much more difficult for you. Um, but I, I, I agree with you from a sense that there is depth finally, that it gives fans some hope for the future. Again, does it make them a deep playoff contender this year? I don't think so. Anything can happen. There's three plus months left and anything could happen, right? Sure. Um, but you're right. I don't think Trout, I think he's in the 250s, going into, uh, going into play on Sunday, he was – three for 32 in the month of June. I, I can't remember a stretch like that mm -hmm. for, for Trouty. Uh, and this is after he hit 245 in the month of May. You know, he hit 317 in April. And it's just kind of been this odd slide downward. Rendon, you know, uh, scotch tape, Gorilla Glue, whatever it takes <laughs> to keep that guy on the field. Bubble and even gum. when he's healthy, you got to have maintenance days. Right. right, he's got to take a day off here and take a can't can't play two three games in a row because you know you want to make sure that he's, you know, healthy for the long term. Mm -hmm. um, you know that kind of is what it is. But there are there are some pieces that that do bring a lot of excitement. You know, Ben Joyce's thing. Thankfully, nothing serious as far as the ligament uh, yeah. that came out on Saturday before the game. Uh, Zach Neto has been freaking awesome to watch. I mean, he's just a, a ball of energy. He's kind of a Dustin Pedroia type player uh, mm -hmm. that the way he plays the game uh, kind of a dirt bag, you know, he's just kind yeah. of that, you know, there's a phrase that gets used uh, a lot, you know, that you know, kind of a dick in the dirt kind of guy. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what he is. He's just, just doesn't matter. He's, he'll do whatever it takes for a team to win. And, and people are drawn to that. And that's why I don't, I don't know why players <laughs> don't play like that more so because you're people love that blue collar style of baseball. Right, uh, and that's what Zach is. And Taylor Ward, hopefully, he's starting to get a swing of things. I feel bad for Jared Walsh. I know we're kind of transitioning because you brought up Walsh, brought up Trout, and brought up Otani, uh, and the Jared Walsh situation is kind of difficult. And I say that because, you know, a limited amount of rehab and coming back you know, rehab assignment right at AAA. What do you do to the psyche of an individual if you send him back down? Right. Um, does so? There's an emotional component. There's a psychological component to it, besides the physical and the mechanical. Uh, and how do you weigh that while still making sure that he's good for the long term this year and beyond? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a fine balance, you know, to like just say, "Hey, glad you made it back, but you you're sucking right now. We're going to send you back down." Yeah. Uh, and what are the implications of doing something like that if something like that is being contemplated? by the front office and I'm going to leave it to you guys to kind of discuss, discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah. You want to, do you want to take it first? Or do you want me to go? Why don't you go? I'll okay. follow up. And Victor, this goes back to when it was just you and I on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about 
how we were talking about giving guys certain leashes, right? Yeah. And we both agreed that the Angels can't afford to give some players a long leash when they're not producing at the major league level. And I kind of feel that way with, with Walsh. I mean, right now, Walsh is our defensive first backup first baseman. Who has on their roster, you know, in this age, a, a defensive late replacement first baseman that can't yeah. hit? Nobody does. So I, I think that he was hitting well in AAA. I don't know what's going on. He's he's really not hitting the ball with any authority. He's I mean, guys, he's hitting like a buck twenty two. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and yep. it's it's and listen, none of us here on this podcast have anything bad to say about Jared Walsh, but we're talking about the Angels and we're talking about what's best for the team. And honestly, I I think they should call up Trey Cabbage. I think the guy's got 16 bombs and 17 stolen bases in AAA. He, he hits left-handed pitchers with power. Um, can play first base. He's not really a great outfielder, but he can play first base. He's not at the defensive um you know, uh, level of Jared Walsh, but I don't know. I, I, I care for Jared Walsh. I know he's been through a lot. I mean, there was what long COVID that he's been doing with Asamia, uh, a, a major injury last year. And, um, he just needs more time, I think, just to get his timing down, you know, and, and maybe they just called him up too soon from AAA. I don't know. Right. What do you think, right. Jeff? Well, and that's the problem, right, is if you called him up too soon, how do you fix that without further damaging his psyche? Because you don't want to do that. Like, to me, that's that's one of the biggest things that, that they need to be concerned about with him is you, you don't want to – That's that's the area of concern. I don't know that the Angels as a team are playing well enough and putting up enough runs that you can let him try to work through it right now. Right. Like in a number nine spot or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're they've had a good week. It was a good week. Yeah. So, you know, cheers to a good week. But oh, you know, this is again? <laughs> if we need to, this is, you know, this is the biggest four game series of the season so far. Yeah. We have to make a stand. And, you know, I don't know if there's a phantom injury that he suffers that puts him on the IL that, you know, lets him kind of take a breather for a while. Um, if that would be better than sending him back down, or if you send him back down to let him work it out, a lot of words, you know, a, a word salad of me basically just saying, I don't know what the answer is. There's, you know, right now in, um, you know, I'm in Colorado, as most people know, we're one game away from winning the NBA championship. And one of the things that has been going on locally here is a lot of critiquing and criticism of the Nuggets coach. Mike Malone and how he has managed Michael Porter Jr. He is just and has been all over his ass for two years, does not let him get away with anything. And people, while other players, he lets stuff slide. And my thought is always, you know, the biggest job of, of, a, of a coach or in a baseball case of, of a manager is to know your players, who needs a kick in the ass and right. who needs a hug. And when we're on the outside, I don't know that we know that. And I don't know what Walsh needs. So I, I have to trust that Nevin knows, that Perry knows, and that they make the right decision. But it's, it's hard right now. It really is. I mean, uh, yeah. 19 games going into Sunday's contest, uh, 133 batting average, OPS of 504. And there's no doubt it's tough. It's tough to watch, right? Mm -hmm. It's just difficult because you root for the guy. You want him to be successful. Yeah. Um, 
He was an all star a couple years yeah, ago. No doubt. It's like it's like if and when Max Stassi comes back. You know, you root for the guy. He missed so much time, and you because he's he's part of your family, and and you know you mm -hmm. want things to be good and happy and, and joyous and, and, and right. being able to be productive for your ball club. And that's, that I think that's what everybody wants for Jared Walsh. And it's just, it, you know, maybe, maybe it is the, the call to bring up cabbage because you're tr at this point of the season, you're trying to find the right pieces that will click together and you can go off and have a, just a ridiculous month of baseball that mm -hmm. helps sets the tone for that playoff run. Um, and I think yeah. that's what it's been a constant, you know, kind of a jigsaw puzzle of trying to figure out which pieces go with which pieces um, for the first couple of months of the season. And just when you think you've got the right pieces, a piece breaks, another piece breaks, another piece struggles. And so I, I don't have a problem with it. I just think that as long as that, that the way it's handled or it comes from the player himself. Hey, I'm, I think I'm doing myself a disservice. I think I'm doing a disservice to the club. Let me go back down to AAA. Let me go down to the complex league. Let me go down to Arizona with right. no stress, no crowds, no nothing. Let me just go work on stuff. Um, I think that's always the best bet. Maybe it is a, a phantom injury that helps uh, perpetuate this. But uh, something does need to happen. It needs to change just so that he gets going. Taylor Ward's kind of been not as, not as bad or obviously – Taylor Ward had such a fantastic year last year. I think everyone, you know, was that the outlier season? Is he back to the mean now? Is he, is, is this who he is? Um, but he is starting to swing the bat a little bit better. Yes, but, yeah. you know, these are just little, this is, I, I don't want to say it's nitpicking because you, this lineup needs one through nine right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. It's, it's not just, oh, if our middle three get going or if our middle four get going, then we're, we're good because you could live. You can live with Walsh in the number nine spot or Taylor Ward in the leadoff spot, whatever you play it out. Uh, you just you just roll with it. Uh, but you can't. Right now, this this team needs one through nine uh, to get things done offensively. And if, if that means you've got to make a move on on Jared, then I think that's that's kind of what you have to do. And the trout thing is 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 weird uh, just because you don't see it. You know, players get to a certain age and obviously they start their decline. I don't know that he's there yet. Um, and the same could be said for Shohei on the, on the pitching side. Yeah. Uh, I know he's calling his own games. Um, and, and, and if you zoom the lens out, it's like, all right, so he's got a three thirty ERA. What's wrong with him? He right. sucks, you know? <laughs> uh, but I think his ERA in June, but a couple of stars, I think just over five, uh, giving up the long ball. Um, and I think, I think people are just trying to figure out, okay, who, who do we have? Uh, how how is he how is he reacting to the possibility of a trade possibility of seeing this through and then walking in free agency like are all those things factoring into his head because i would imagine that there are some off the field business dealings i know i'd be thinking about it i know i'd be wanting to talk about it planning something and hey this is our game plan going into the off season you know does that play into it i don't i don't know i'm just saying I, i'm just kind of just opening up the the door to see if there if there's a reason for it because stuff wise he's still 97 maybe he's a little mm -hmm. bit down velocity wise the other day he was very pedestrian at 94 95 uh, which is still exceptionally good um but you know the further and further you go and you start to see the articles coming out the dylan hernandez article that came out yep. uh in the la times it's a it's a weird it's a weird dynamic, right? Because he's right, Dylan. That is that the best opportunity to get the biggest package of players in return was last year, so that you have a year and a half mm -hmm. of of the star maker. And, and you know, I I hope that that's not the case. To be perfectly honest, with you, that they are keeping him on the roster, not going to trade him, in hopes that they have a chance of re-signing him in the off season. I just, I think you have to do what's best for your franchise today and into the future, regardless of it. Because if you think you've got the money to sign him in the off season, then it doesn't matter whether you trade him or not. I don't think you're going to hurt his feeling or ruffle his feather. I think he's bright enough, smart enough, and is advised well enough by Nez Bolello that they would realize it's strictly a business decision if they decide to trade him. 
And then in the offseason, you'll make another business decision as you weigh the contract offers from whatever teams, the Angels being one of them, you'll weigh that as a business decision as well with, with setting aside anything that happened in the, in the season if there was a trade or anything like that, barring any fallout. And I'm just, you know, I think sure. I'm done pontificating on the subject <laughs> of Shohei, <laughs> Shohei Otani. Hey, what are your thoughts, Jeff, on Otani? You know, I... Reading the article in the, in the LA Times, you know, also last week we had the, um, you know, Ken Rosenthal was on I think Fox Sports and said he didn't feel that there was any chance that Otani was going to be uh, re-signing with the Angels. You know, left out there kind of the, but we'll see kind of things. But he was, it was pretty clear the message he was trying to get across. You know, then there's the LA Times article where, you know, they're, they're essentially saying the angels aren't going to move him. Art, Artie's not going to move him. He already feels like he wants to go all in to keep him. which I simultaneously, I think on the first pass, my reaction was yes. Like, hell yeah. Let's, let's do that. Followed quickly by, oh boy, is that the right move? Like, what if we, what if he goes somewhere and we get nothing for him? Like, right. how how horrible would that be? But I kind of rewind to when he came here in the first place. I was stunned. I think the entire baseball world was stunned that he picked Anaheim. Yep. Is, so is there something about this place, this environment, this small town, large media center you know, kind of melding that Anaheim is, right? You're you're in the LA Metroplex. So you've got the second largest media market in the world, but you're down in Orange County where things are kind of chill and laid back and you know, all the attention is a little bit more up up north. He's gonna get his money. You know, I don't know if yeah. it's gonna be five hundred million, six hundred million. He's gonna get what he gets. But once you're getting half a billion dollar contract, I, I don't know that that's, that's the part that he's worrying about as much as where does he really want to be? And he seems to be, ha and let me, I'm sorry, Chuck, let me end it with this. He seems to be having a blast. Like every time they show him in the dugout, he is playing with the fellas and he's laughing and joking and having a great time. I, I don't know that you can take that but as anything but a fantastic sign. But what, what, what else do you think he'd be doing, though, be acting like Kenny Powers? I mean, yeah, yeah, seriously. Well, <laughs> I, you know. We've seen enough athletes over the years that are best case stoic and worst yeah. case just douchebags, you know, off on their own, you know, making it clear to everybody that they want to be anywhere else but there. Yeah. Shohei is doing exactly not that. Right. He's having a blast. He's having fun. He is part of this team. And what does that ultimately amount to? Maybe nothing, but also maybe everything. I don't, it's again, reading the tea leaves, but if I wanted to, if I got to choose one or the other, I'm much more happy with the way that he's acting right now than what the alternative could possibly be. We've said on this podcast uh, many times that in, I know you guys would agree with this, that if you knew that Otani would not, is not going to sign, he's going to explore free agency that you should probably trade him. If the angels are not in contention mm -hmm. by the trading deadline. So obviously, you know, this month and next month are going to be huge, right? So mm -hmm. that's why all these questions that are coming to the mailbag about trading Otani, what we can get for him, all this stuff. I'm like, guys, chill. When, when it's time, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Now mm -hmm. is not the time. One thing I'll say is I know we've been, you know, bagging on Shoei Otani's, you know, pitching of late. But the guy leads the – I mean – Offensively, he is the offensive leader across the board mm -hmm. statistically. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is the guy. And so, yeah, he's had some rough patches. Victor, I wanted to mention, uh, I think it was episode 
three or four. Um, you you said, why doesn't Shohei throw his four seamer enough? Because it's an out pitch. I mean, they can mm-hmm. barely catch up to it. And then I'm going to give the word to you, the sweeper, because everybody's <laughs> like, oh, my gosh, you know, People are only, you know, opposing hitters are only hitting a buck fifty nine off his sweeper. And well, when they hit me, those, it goes over the fence. That's and that's my point. Yeah, that's where I'm going to. So he's got a three sixty three slugging percentage against the pitch, but against his four seamer, it's a buck eighty nine. And against his splitter, I mean, it's a you know, it's two. I mean, it's two hundred. So. Obviously, his four seamer and splitter are outperforming the sweeper, which everybody just it drives it drives me nuts as much as it does you, um, Victor. But <laughs> I I think what it is is he's calling his own pitches. This when he's going from his fastball to that sweeper, that's <laughs> that thing's just. I mean, when they're crushing it, it's just like floating right into the zone, and you can yeah. you can see it coming. They're like, "That's a meatball." Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and it's called a sweeper because it's a different depth and a different break and a different speed correct. than a slider. Mm-hmm. Yeah, slider. Yeah, it's a slower breaking slider. Okay, yeah, got it. So it's a sweeper Slurve, sweeping right into I the mean, yeah. sweeping right into the barrel of bats. I was um, gonna say it's called a sweeper because the home plate umpire has to sweep home plate <laughs> after the runner <laughs> touches home after hitting a home run. It's funny how no, many people the other day on Twitter there. thought I was serious when I said uh, maybe if you stop calling it a sweeper it'll stay in the ballpark. Like I said that in jest and people are like, oh maybe if you stop calling it a big fly we get to the playoffs. I'm like I'm thinking to myself uh, how's that worked for you the last two years, Joey, since I haven't been calling any <laughs> yeah. games, you know, seriously. <laughs> Take that. I mean, on, yeah. Yeah. I know it's Twitter, right? I mean, it was a better pitch for him in 2022 last year, but this year in, we'll have to find out Jeff, you know, we talked about it last week. We need to find out when Shoei Otani decided to call his own game and not roll on his catchers. Yeah, but how much of that is an overture by the team to say, whatever you want, whatever you want to do here, it, carte blanche, here's yeah. the blank check. But every team's going to do that. Every team's going to do that. Sure, but they've got him now. So right. they're doing everything they can to create an environment that makes it as difficult to leave as possible. Well, if that's the case, then why... Why wouldn't you have made a play prior to the season to lock him up before the end of this year? And you've put yourself in the corner to have to deal with 29 other teams as opposed to one-on-one. It's us and you. Mm-hmm. Do you want to be here? Yes, no, maybe. Then if you do, then here's our, our offer now. Let's just, let's just put this to bed right now. Right. Because uh, that I mean, that's what I would have done. Now, granted, the, the whole putting the team up for sale certainly mm-hmm. – threw a, a, a big monkey wrench into all of that. It kind of, everything right. had to kind it of did. come to a halt because yeah. of it. But if you knew that as an owner, I mean, already knew whether or not he was going to sell at one point. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when he decided that at that, at that point, why would you have that conversation? And maybe they did, but it hasn't been leaked out. Sure. Most things get leaked out, even though the angels are, they like to play things very close to the vest. As soon as Artie decides or the family decides, we're not going to sell. We want to keep the team. I love this team, whatever the case may be. Hey, Nez, Shohei, let's get together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to keep the team. This is what, this is my vision going forward. This is what I want to do. Have Trout there, whatever the case may be. You know, who you want some input on the manager, the next manager? Fine. What's the number? And, and see if he can get it done. Yeah. That way, at least you have some sort of an understanding of where he is mentally, uh, as he looks at or thinks about free agency after this year. Yeah. I, and again, I don't know if it did happen or didn't. I'm just saying that that's how I would have played it because if yeah. I, he, I have him under control. Like I want mm-hmm. him to be here. I've rolled out the red carpet as much as possible for him. We've tried to cater to everything imaginable to make sure that he stays here long-term. And he did pick the angels. There's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. He picked the angels uh, and the angels were just as surprised as the entire baseball world when he made that decision <laughs> several years ago. Um, 
And it's to your point, Jeff, I think it was really because of that small town feel in a big market mm -hmm. where he gets the best of both worlds. He can hide a little bit. Uh, and I think that's what was appealing for Albert. I think that's what was appealing for Trout. Uh, a lot of guys like that, the, yeah. that they do have that, that ability to kind of hide, if you will, in Orange County. And I don't mean that negatively. Don't get me wrong. No, no. Uh, but outside the limelight. Yep. Uh, but still get the the benefits of being in the number two media market in the country. Mm -hmm. So can I go real quick, uh, Victor? Uh -huh. There are some that think that that Artie just wants butts in the seats. And Otani obviously is going to draw butts in the seats and, you know, viewership, right? Uh, you know what gets network. butts in the seats, Chuck? Winning, winning. baseball games. Winning yep. Yeah, uh, divisions, winning playoff games. That's what oh, gets I, this is in not. This is not me defending him. I know. Trust I'm me. just saying through through all of time, baseball, football, basketball, soccer. Mm -hmm. It does not matter. You winning win, cures people all. will come <laughs> exactly, and right. you win and people come. You can charge a little bit more, and it helps your bottom line. And nobody right. blinks at it as much as hey, you're suck or you're sucking. You continue to suck. Why are you mm -hmm. raising prices and so on and so forth? So. I, I get it. Look, I understand it. I, I get the whole family atmosphere, the whole Disney mentality. This is kind of Orange County. It's a, it's a thing. It, I Atmosphere, I totally get it. But you want people to legitimately come to the ballpark. And it's not so much as just buying season tickets or buying individual game tickets. It's getting people to come to the ballpark. That's where you make your money. Parking, yeah. merchandising, souvenirs, concessions. That's, that's called per caps. That, that, mm -hmm. That's what you look at, right? It's like, how much money are people spending inside the ballpark? Because one is a, is a revenue number that you could determine before the season starts to say, okay, I got tickets sold, but I need my money that's coming through the turnstiles, through the parking and everything else. So the only way to really guarantee that is win and mm -hmm. consistently win. Why do you think the Angels had that stretch of 3 million plus fans for whatever it was, 13, 14 years? Even right. though the back end years were a little... A little sketchy. I mean, tickets sold. You didn't have three million people come through the turnstiles. <laughs> yeah. There's just no chance you did. You had tickets sold, right? Uh, because I saw it. I saw it my, you guys saw it with your own eyes. Yeah. So that ballpark wasn't filled every night. Um, 2019, 2018. It just wasn't. Right. Um, but it was in the late 90s and in the 2000 or 2000s and into you know by 2009, 2010, it was still going strong. 11, 12, 14, they get to the playoffs, still going strong. But then all of a sudden, you just, you're mediocre and people right. stop coming to the ballpark. They, there's way too many other things to do in Southern California, mm -hmm. whether it's the Angels, Dodgers, doesn't matter. Way too yep. many other things to do uh, if, if you're not winning baseball. And I get Angel fans are different in that there is an emotional connection to the club, the franchise, the area, the ballpark that is not tied to winning which makes that, that fan base somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Dodger fans, and, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn because I don't, I don't know Dodger fans all that well other than the 11 seasons I spent there in Southern California, but their, their, their fandom is, it has either been passed down from generation to generation, mm -hmm. going back to Brooklyn, or it's because of the recent winning that they've done, that huge stretch of winning baseball that makes guys, people that go out to the ballpark on an everyday basis. So it, it, it's a unique animal. But you, it, in order to consistently fill that ballpark, which is exactly what you want to do on an every night basis, you got to win, man. You got to win. It's not the hope of, oh, every fifth day I got to show you. The Royals did it. Zach Greinke, they, they were awful. But every fifth day they had Zach Greinke and fireworks and they had a packed house. That's right. cool. How, how far did that get you? Now, they did get to the World Series. They had a good core of players, and that place was packed every single, every single night. Now look at where the Royals are. What are they, two or three games worse than the Oakland A's because the Oakland A's just went on a five-game winning streak? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of going a lot of different directions, but it all boils down to just win, baby. Al Davis. Right. That's it. Yep. That's true. Seriously. All right. Do you guys have nothing to add on that? That's serious. That was a lot of stuff. I threw, I teed you guys up on a ton of shit and you guys didn't do anything with it. What What's am I here I, for? I think that the call out of that angels fans are different is something I have always felt, but it's interesting to hear you kind of confirm it. Uh, I see that as well, that, that real angels fans, and you get a sense of who they are, 
you know, they went through, you know, depending on how old they are, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, of a team that was just horrible with flashes of, you know, flashes of wins. You know, you, you had some high spots with, you know, Nolan Ryan in the 70s. They made a couple of runs in the 80s, a couple, couple of runs in the 90s with some some nice teams. But, you know, I think I said a couple podcasts ago, it, you know, having season tickets growing up, my family, there were nights that I went to that ballpark with five or 6,000 people, and that was it. It was empty, but those were fans that loved the team and loved those players. It was fun in the early 2000, you know, 2002 through 2011, 12, yeah. when they were a contender every year and battling. And and that stadium was electric yep. during that time. Yep. Mm -hmm. People want to get back to that. Right. And yep. I don't know, Chuck. I'd... No, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, and winning is going to cure everything. And we talked about this earlier. I think that they have the recipe to put it together this year. It's unfortunate that the Texas Rangers, you know, you look at the signings last year, Victor, and I don't know about you, but Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager, like, what are they doing? You know, they're, they're adding two big bats, but where's their pitching? All right. Right. And then they go in um, all in this year. They get uh, DeGrom. It hasn't worked out for him. Um, they got Yovaldi, who, who's been really good. Yeah. John Gray has put it together. He's been a great pitcher for them. And um, you just, you know, it's, I, I think that, you know, you, you got, you're chasing the Rangers who are just unworldly right now. And you got the Houston Astros who are just, have been dominating this division for a long time. And that's why getting back to what we were talking about earlier, guys, about how long of a leash do you give some players? Yeah. And I even mean, do you really not even have a conversation with Otani and said, I'm sorry, but your pitching is not as good as it was last year. Can we have the catcher call the game? In fact, don't even ask him to say, this is the way we're going to do it. I know that they want to try to tiptoe around on, they're walking on eggshells because they want to keep him, but you got to win ball games. Yeah. And so no it, that's my take. No doubt. Well, we kind of talked about the week ahead, obviously with the Rangers four game series, three against the Kansas City Royals. Um, six and one is, you know, I think is what you should, should be shooting for obviously mm -hmm. taking three or four and then sweeping the Royals in Kansas city. Uh, that just goes without saying, uh, I think if you go two and two and, th and then you sweep, yeah, it's still a, still a good week. Uh, but you don't really gain a whole lot of ground. Uh, right. I, I, I just, yeah, I think psychologically you want to go three out of four, if not sweep, uh, <laughs> God, can you imagine the three out of four or sweep of the Rangers? <laughs> and then you go poo poo the bed in Kansas City. I was City. just going to say, oh, oh. Miami. Yeah. Oh. oh, that would stink. Like that they did stink. against Miami. Yeah. They were on a yeah. roll and then they just got swept mm -hmm. by Miami. Yeah. yeah. Miami keeps playing pretty decent baseball. They just beat the White Sox. Uh, all right. So let's get to uh, the, uh, the mailbag because we are running out of time here. Yeah. Mailbag. Let's do it. So we've mailbag, talked a mailbag. lot about uh, a lot about trout has been uh, were a lot of the questions. So Joe from Claremont, Luke from Riverside, Ryan from North Carolina, Dan from Garden Grove, and Noah from Mission Viejo. I think we covered most of your questions just in our in our discussion. Um, let's see. Let's go to uh, let's go to. I loved this last night, so I'm going to throw this out as the first question. Did it fire you up to see Phil Nevin go absolutely insane at home plate umpire Saturday night and get kicked out of the game? And is that what the Angels needed to light a fire under them? Yes. It fired you up. <laughs> I was fired up. up. We lost, and that was my silver lining of the night. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, we've, we've talked about you know, that not having that guy on the team, 
right? That is kind of that that spark plug. Mm -hmm. I liked seeing it from the manager because we're not getting it from anybody in the lineup. So yes, they and and is that part of why they responded as such today? It was a quite a performance. Victor, this is an alley oop to you. We were talking about this two weeks ago about who the team leader is. Yeah, I'll let you go. (laughs) <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't think players get fired up because a manager loses his his mind on an umpire. Uh, you know, that, that call last night by, by Phil Cuzzy was off the plate, uh, borderline as it was. I mean, Shohei knows the strike zone pretty well. Even though Shohei, if you watch right. the replay, was cheating for inside pitch and was right. wide open and was, would have been exposed. Uh, but he has so much plate coverage with his swing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that easily could have been a, a flare right over the third base or shortstop's head for a base right. hit, and it kind of keeps the inning alive. So, um, so no. To answer your question, I I don't I don't get fired up about stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's just a I I, I don't know. I, look, I, Phil's got a job to do. Phil's trying to earn a job for next year and and beyond, whether it's with the Angels or otherwise. And so he's doing whatever he thinks. Uh, needs to be done to get his team motivated. And so if the players respond or based on what he did, uh, that outburst, and then, then so be it. Uh, but personally speaking, I don't, uh, I think it's just kind of, you know, kind of covering for, for Shohei and making sure that he's protecting his players. I think I think most, for the most part, I think people know that Phil's going to cover his players. He's not going to throw mm-hmm. anybody under the bus. Hasn't done so. Um, and so I think I think it's understood in the clubhouse that he is going to take care of his guys and and go to bat for them. Uh, but no, it didn't fire me up. All right, Chuck, <laughs> you're alone on the island, man. So, <laughs> I was fired up. Yeah. And, you know, fired getting up. back to the the previous segment. Hey, but then again, my old man got tossed by three guys simultaneously, <laughs> so everything else is bullshit. So. <laughs> But honestly, but honestly, what do you guys think about this? Okay, I thought about this when it was happening. Does Shohei Otani look at his manager going out there to have his back and just raising hell to the umpire um, and say, "This, this is my family. This is I've been here since I've come to the major leagues, and this manager has got my back. The players have my back." You know, does he look at it like a like that, you know, uh, incident last night is like, this is my manager. And um, I, I mean, what do you guys think? What do you think? Victor? Is there anything to be said for that? I mean, as a player, when you no. when you no, can no. I tag on to that question? Sorry. Are you answering that question, Victor, as the son of a manager or do you feel like <laughs> that that's different for a player whose dad is sitting up in the, you know, section one eighty five, and no, and- I, I I think we're kind of I think you're really zooming the microscope way in on you're trying to take one incident and say that oh man that this this is the reason why I might want to stay here is because Phil Nevin stood up for me so no no I'm I'm, I'm looking at it just from a I don't know my feet firmly planted on the ground as a just guy that has seen a lot of baseball i just yeah. i don't and and i've talked to a lot of players and no personalities and mm-hmm. weird dude weird dudes good dudes bad dudes I've, I've run across them all i just don't think that shohei doesn't come across as a guy like oh well gosh he stood up for me on that call against phil cuzzy well there's a lot of managers that have gone up against phil cuzzy this year <laughs> and throughout <laughs> phil cuzzy's career so is that really saying a whole lot i mean uh yeah, maybe it does, but I, I don't I don't think so, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't I don't think that's the difference maker of mm-hmm. whether or not Shohei stays is whether or not Phil has his back. I, I think that's just understood. I think he does. I think I would imagine he does. I mean, unless there's something that's happened that we don't know about where he feels spurned by his manager, coaching staff, front office, whatever the case may be. I just don't think that's the case. So yeah. That's my that's my two cents. But I will say before we move to the next question. <laughs> but I did fire we Chuck up. Next question, <laughs> before we move to the next question, I will say this. I visibly for the first time saw Shohei Otani throw an F bomb. And that yeah. pleased me. 
Well, it's probably because he listened to your podcast last week. And right. He was just dropping F-bombs left and right. It's like, oh, Chuck, that's how they do it here. Okay. Chuck, Got you it. are impacting the game with your you. uh, by teaching him language. All right. <laughs> From Sean in Santa Ana, he wants to know, will Joe Odell get dealt another get dealt for another arm, either a starter or somebody in the bullpen. So Joe came back uh, for a quick stint. First at, first at bat, hit one, uh, like launched one home run. Yeah. It was good to see. Uh, what yeah. do you guys think? Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, I, man, I'm lukewarm on that. And I'll say it. Be, the reason why is because Hunter Renner, Hunter Renfro is a free agent at the end of this season. Um, are you going to roll the dice with Mickey Moniak <clears throat> or are you going to go with your first round pick in the organization? I, I <sighs> Have you lost the love for Mickey? Mickey's I not so Mickey. fine anymore. <laughs> come on jeff sing it you know we we got to get some uh hey i'm Mick- not i'm not gonna sing it but i <laughs> thank you it's uh yeah you're but welcome I, okay <laughs> but, but, but victor i will say this that uh, are you really gonna trade joe adele just for a relief pitcher no i i mean you no. gotta get something substantial in my opinion and you know you can evaluate him and say well i mean He's not going to have the same type of value he would have like four years ago, right? And that's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I know you guys would agree with this. He was mm-hmm. rushed to the big leagues. Mm-hmm. I mean, no doubt. But yeah. at the same time, he's got a world of talent, and maybe he's only what 24, 23, 24? Yeah, is he twenty three? Anyway, he's still super young. He's putting together a, a fine season in AAA. He's still striking out a little bit too much, uh, but he's playing great defense. And he went with the mindset is, I'm just going to hit home runs. And I'm going to play great defense, and I'm not going to cost my team. And I I like that. And I, I don't think you should just trade him away. If you get somebody that's a everyday player for him, I don't know where that fits. I mean, maybe second base because I, I, I don't know. You got Drury. I mean, scratch that. I don't know. I mean, do you trade Odell for? I don't trade him for a bullpen arm. I just don't. No. I mean, the bullpen. I, I agree. Fine. I'm I sorry. Agree. I keep. I keep him. That's my answer. And you're sticking to it. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, yeah. I. Right now, he's reestablished his his market. Um, yep. And so I think, I think if you're overwhelmed with the package, it starts with a starting pitcher, then, then yeah, I'd certainly entertain it. But to your point, I think you have, yeah, you get right field and then, you know, left field is Taylor, Taylor Ward. I mean, is he your guy? Is he the answer um, going forward? And right. so I think you, you just have to kind of hold off for right now. There's no, there's no reason to, you're not one starting pitcher away or one position player away from going to the promised land and winning a ring. Uh, and so I think, I think you have to look at it from a big picture perspective. Uh, if you're overwhelmed and it starts with a, a starting pitcher, you know, even, a, even a guy that's a triple a right now, that's on the, on the cusp of getting to the big leagues mm-hmm. with a, with a position player at a lower level or sorry, two position player, then I'd, I'd probably entertain it just to see what it is. But um, yeah, I, I, right now I wouldn't. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we got time for one more, buddy. One more. Terry from Orange asks. Terry. Terry. Terry Fallon from Orange. Uh, What is the status of all the pitchers from the year the Angels drafted only pitchers? So I I think it was 2021. The Angels drafted 20 pitchers uh, that that uh, that draft. And Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think Silseth is the only one of those that has made it to the major so far. Um, thoughts on, on that and, you know, what the I, status I is of was, any of the I other 19? Sam Bachman, too, right? I mean, he was our first round okay. pick. Okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. Look, if you hit on two of 20, that's in, in the big leagues. Yep. That's. That's not bad. Yeah. I mean, it's still early, right? Because they, they've mm-hmm. yet to establish like a a career, if you will, at the major yeah. league level. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to have two guys reach the big leagues 
uh, from just a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, I think that's 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 a pretty good number. I mean, yeah. it's hard right. it's hard to get to the big leagues. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's what you're looking. That that mindset that Perry took one because you, you had zero depth from a pitching perspective in the minor leagues is kind of something that a lot of GMs look at the international market as. Uh, and you have to ask your question your, yourself the question when you're looking at it is if you you've got a pool of money right and if the class is not as deep as you think it is uh, or it should be do you take all of that money and split it among one or two players or or two to three players or do you take that pool of money and split it amongst 10 to 12 players in hopes that you get two or three of those guys mm-hmm. that make enough noise, even at the lower levels of the minor leagues, that become a piece to a trade, or mm-hmm. if they end up, you know, climbing the ladder in your organization, fantastic. But someone that you could, like a Joe Adele and X player that was part of that international draft, you know, that that complements a it sets up a trade package for the the person you actually need for your roster today and into next year. So that it, it's funny how he, you know, it doesn't happen often. Uh, what was it? The Royals took, wasn't it like the first five picks that they had or oh, six yeah. picks? Brady Singer couple, and yeah, uh, the three yeah. dudes out of Florida. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, they've had guys get to the big leagues, but they just haven't been, yeah. you know, <laughs> steady enough big leaguers to make an impact. But, you roll the dice on doing something like that. And those guys are college guys. So those guys are, you would think a lot closer to getting to the big leagues, uh, than, than, you know, unless there's an outlier high school kid, that's just, you know, kind yeah. of a Jim Abbott type talent or something like right. that. It's just, it just goes crazy. But, um, what are your impressions before we quit, uh, of Sam Bachman out of the bullpen? I think that, uh, we've talked about this on the website quite a bit. He has trouble at times repeating his delivery yeah. as a starting pitcher. And we've always felt with his high velo and his wipeout slider that he's a guy that could be a damn good bullpen arm. And he, so far, he's shown to be you really good. Bullpen, bullpen arms are right; they're failed starters, whether it's yeah, in the minor leagues cheap, or the big leagues. Right. That's that's that, that's yeah. just the reality of it. At some point, you know, guys with good arms were starters, and the reason mm-hmm. they're not still starters, whether it's in college <laughs> or in professional baseball, is because they weren't very good starters, but they got a big arm. Yeah. Uh, and they have the mentality. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's really about the mentality, especially those late inning guys uh, that love yeah. that adrenaline rush and love that, that, you know, no fear kind of approach to the game. Uh, and some guys are just built that way that they're better off emptying the tank for 20 to 25 pitches rather than, Hey, I'm, uh, I, I'm going, I'm supposed to go six innings today and I'm going to try to save a little energy here, peel back on the fastball. So I have a little more fastball in the fourth or fifth innings. So guys, it just, it doesn't click for them mentally, physically, otherwise mechanically. Uh, and they're better off just being a bullpen piece. So I, I think he's doing a fine job. Yeah. It, it, it takes time to kind of feel your way through the transition to a bullpen so that you can consistently and effectively get hitters out on a nightly basis. And I think that's the biggest change for anybody that goes from starter to bullpen is it, it, Ben Joyce, perfect example, going from college, a weekend guy to all, all of a sudden having to be a reliever at professional level where you're pitching back to back days or one day off, you know, back to back days again. And that's just the, the nature of the beast. So uh, okay. I, I, I think he's got a pretty good chance of being successful. That's good. I mean, because, I mean, as you well know, it's, it, these relievers are expensive, especially closers or yep. setup mm-hmm. guys these days. And if you can develop your own, even if you have a failed starter, but he actually excels as a reliever, yep. the Angels need those type of guys. No doubt. So. No doubt. Indeed. Gentlemen, episode eight is in the books. It was a pleasure. An well hour done. of just joy of being, <laughs> just spending time with you guys and sharing thoughts on Otani <laughs> Trout, the, uh, the angels in general, uh, we appreciate all of you for listening and for interacting with uh, the guys on Twitter. We really appreciate it. If you haven't uh, tuned in to us. What's your problem? I mean, because really, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's, that's on you. It's certainly not on us. Yeah. Uh, but we're very grateful for the interactions that we've had and that uh, you enjoy the the podcast. If you got any questions or comments, feel free to just hit us up on uh, on uh, on Twitter. Is probably the best way to do it. But uh, Jeff, do we have an email address that we people can send the uh, questions to? 
Uh, we don't have an email address. Okay. It's posted all week on our The Angels Win Twitter feed, though. Uh, so jump on there, uh, grab the link to the mailbag, submit your question, and as you see, we go through we go through them out. We call out your name, and uh, we love hearing from you. Actually, we do have an email address. It's Chuck at AngelsWin dot com. There you go. Yeah, yeah well, it's send, good to be the king. All- <laughs> good to be the king. <laughs> All right, you're, guys. You're going to get signed Pleasure. up for so much stuff, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> for Chuck Richter, Jeff Stoddard, I'm Victor Ross. Thanks for listening to the Angels Win Podcast. We'll talk to you next week, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Angels Win Podcast with Victor Rojas, Chuck Richter, and Jeff Stoddard. Go Halos and drive home safely. I say goodbye.